So what are we going to talk about? The, the title of the talk gives it away a little bit. I'm going to talk about scalability as different from performance, what it means, how you get there, and more importantly, how you don't get there, some of the things that block it, how it relates to performance, because it's a pretty close cousin, but not the same, and what characterizes a scalable architecture and a scalable design. They're, again, related, but not the same thing. And what's this perfect scalability? We will speak of perfection today. It sounds very zen. But and how do I get that? You know, how do I aim for that point where I can, in fact, keep scaling to the level that I need? Because everyone's trying to achieve a higher level of scalability often. So let's start by defining the term. Scalability is not the same as performance. Like I said, they're close cousins. And I would characterize an increase in performance as saying, OK, I can take the same load I was running before, but I can now do it faster. All right. So in other words, I can handle the same number of requests in a shorter amount of time. Adding hardware, which is adding resources in general, usually hardware, increases the speed of handling requests. But it doesn't necessarily say the total volume of requests I can handle went up. That's actually scalability. So scalability is the ability to handle a larger load without failure, not necessarily at the same performance. So performance may, in fact, decrease, but it didn't break. You can now handle that load, and requests are still being handled at a reasonable non-error rate of, of response. So I can, if I can handle more requests in the same amount of time, which sounds surprisingly like performance, not quite, uh, and adding hardware increases my ability to handle more requests. So I get more load. I don't just handle the same load faster. This is easier with pictures. So a system under load, right? the world's simplest diagram. Increasing load goes in this direction. The response time, so the time it takes us to handle every request, goes in this direction. This is a typical system. Somewhere, there's going to be a curve like that, sometimes even a little sharper, which is where we've reached the limit of our ability to scale. Now, the normal reaction is, let's throw some more hardware at it. Either scale vertically by adding more capacity to the existing machine, or scale horizontally by adding more machines. Great, let's see the effect of that and see again the difference between scalability and performance. So let's say we increase performance. What that means is that the whole curve moves down. It doesn't necessarily mean we change the shape of the curve. So our response time is better. So every response is coming back in a shorter period of time. Great, performance is up. But there's still this dog leg down here. And that's the one we would worry about. That's a point we'll talk about later. But what's happening is that's our limit of scalability. We haven't necessarily changed that by increasing performance. Often we will. Often we'll not get exactly the same shape curve. We'll move it a little bit. But there will still be a point like this somewhere in our, somewhere in our graph. Increasing scalability, on the other hand, is a different animal. What that means, without necessarily affecting performance, is that I have now moved my line to the right. I didn't necessarily bring it down, although often you will a little bit, and often you'll change the shape of it somewhat as well. But if I strictly increased scalability, I will have moved my line to the right without necessarily moving it down. So I'm not actually responding to requests any faster than I was before, but a larger volume of requests on the overall system is no longer met with either an error or a very rapidly increasing response time, usually followed by an error. You know, that's typically what, what lives at the top of that curve is uh, 500 or some other manner of nasty error. So that's what I mean by the difference between performance and scalability. Close cousins, not exactly identical. So I talked in the title about perfect scalability. Wouldn't that be nice? So what would that look like if we had it? What would it look like if we were to achieve it so that we know what the goal is that we're talking about? Well, obviously, we'd be able to handle higher and higher load by increasing resources, not just on the same box. Uh, that would be a magic computer or a quantum computer, maybe, but that's later. Um, if the re so really what we're saying is perfect scalability would be characterized by a linear relationship between adding resources and being able to handle more load. So to give you an example, if I can handle 1,000 requests on one node and I can handle exactly 2,000 requests if I have two nodes, well, so far, I have perfectly linear scalability. That's what I mean by perfect scalability. Now, there are many, many things that interfere with that, obviously, right? All of us would like to say, fine, just get some more instances. Now, if you want to handle more requests on each node, 
that sometimes is a problem for performance or vertical scalability on that single node. But often when we go to scale nowadays, we're talking about horizontal scalability where we're actually, actually adding more hardware resources to the system. So perfect scalability would look like this. The curve would perhaps increase over the first little while, but eventually as we start adding more resources, it would either be flat or possibly even decrease just a little. But effectively, no dog leg. That's the big difference, is that no matter how far we go across in this graph, if we never find the dog leg, then we've achieved perfect scalability. Don't see this a whole lot, <laughs> I have to say. You know, it doesn't happen every day. But of course, that's the ideal that we aim for, right? How much, how close to perfection you need to get for your system depends on what load you need to handle. Obviously, you would like to say your predicted load is here and the dog leg is way off there in the corner somewhere, right? You've got that nice buffer zone. So your scalability may not be perfect, but it's sufficient. But if you aim, for perfect scalability in terms of your design principles, you'll always screw up in a few places, and you'll end up with a curve that you can live with. That's really the reality of projects that we've seen out in the field over the years working with uh, Scala, ACA, the whole ecosystem. So what would a perfectly scalable system look like? How would, how, what, would one, what would one look like in terms of the nuts and bolts of an actual system? Great, let's say we add two integers. Very sophisticated, right? We've all written one of these, haven't we? Um, an HTTP API arbitrarily could be anything. The two numbers passed as a parameter on the URL and the result is in the response. That sounds like it should scale pretty well, right? There's not a lot of things that would prevent that scaling. If we fired up a second node, well, we should be able to do twice as many requests now that we have two nodes and so on and so on. So why does this system scale was the question we started asking ourselves because over the years, my team and myself have started thinking, you know, what are the characteristics when we win? And what are the characteristics when we lose? And then what are the theoretical underpinnings? And what should we avoid? And what should we aim for? So one of the things that's beautiful about that incredibly simple system I just described is there's no state, right? There's nothing holding on. I'm not saying accumulate the grand total of all of the two integers that I've added anywhere. So there's no retained value at all. Maybe not too practical, but again, we were looking at a simplistic example. We share nothing. So if I've got five nodes all doing this computation, they have no idea each other exists, right? They're completely independent from each other. There's nothing being shared between them. All of the computations are independent, which is another way of saying we share nothing. So in other words, this adding of two and two has nothing to do with this adding of two and two. One does not rely on the other. So we don't share state. We don't have a dependency. We don't communicate. Sounds pretty darn scalable, right? Can't imagine any reason it wouldn't scale. It's a little flawed. This is a rocket launch gone really badly wrong. Um, if all of those nodes, weirdly enough, are on, let's say, the same HTTP namespace, somewhere in there, there's a load balancer. And somewhere in there, at a certain level of scale, that load balancer is going to start to get really warm. <laughs> and a fan's going to kick on. And eventually, we may, in fact, find a dog leg in that curve way down. I mean, you know, load balancers are pretty good. And elastic load balancing is good. So I would characterize that as its scalability being very good, but not perfect even that simple a system. Why? Why would that scalability not be perfect? Well, we share something. We share something very lightly, and that's that namespace, but somewhere along the line, maybe there's a load balancer that we share. Eventually, that load balancer will hit its limit. Even if we have a cluster of load balancers, we will eventually hit that limit. So what could we maybe do about it? Well, we would break it up, let's say, into multiple namespaces and maybe make a smart client. And I'm just throwing this out as one way to do it. Yes, that's a rocket with duct tape, and that looks like a gas station in the background. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Ship it. Um, go to production. So why would this help? Why would doing this to our crazy little theoretical system, what, what have we, what's the characteristic we've just modified? Because that's what we've been trying to do over the years, working with systems like this, is what just worked? <laughs> why, why would that be a good thing to do? How does it get us closer to perfect scalability? Well, unlike in real life, the answer is we shared less and we got closer to perfection. So we took the tiny little bit that we were sharing on that load balancer, theoretically, and we tried to eliminate it. So we actually reduced our sharing. This is how we came up with a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today, is we looked at real world systems, we looked at things we did to increase their scalability, every now and then bumping their performance as well and going, well, that didn't help that much, because all that did was move the curve, not push the dog leg out. And we tried to think about what we've actually 
modify? What principle did we just change? And that's what I want to give you today is some of that history, some of the things that we've discovered. Make sense to everybody? Everybody still with me? Okay. I can't actually see most of you, so if you doze off. Um, so I, I think it was Stephen Hawking who first said, every time you introduce a formula to your presentation, uh, or your book, in his case, 50% of the readership goes away. So I think three quarters of you will have to leave at some point because there's two formulas. <laughs> um, one is something I'm sure we've all heard of, Amdahl's Law. And the idea is simply saying that the percentage of the time you spend in a parallel, well, parallelizable portion of your application, spell check doesn't know what that means, by the way, and the portion of your time you spend in the purely sequential portion of an application, he was talking about on a single processor, 100% minus that parallelizable time is the upper bound on how much parallelism or distribution can help. So you could have a perfectly parallelized system distributed all to pieces, and that's your upper bound. Because if there's some portion of your system that still requires sequential operation, you can't ever optimize beyond it. So now, again, he was talking at the time about a single processor and in a single computing, you know, the, the typical von Neumann uh, architecture. Obviously, we've mostly gone beyond that now. Um, there's an honorable mention of Gustafson's uh, counter-argument to this, but the bottom line is if only 50% of your algorithm is parallelizable, then the absolute best that anything can do in terms of distribution for you is 50%, and that's if everything were perfect. Now, it's not even that good. The news is actually worse than this. Um, Gunther's Law, which takes it a little bit further, and I won't, again, I won't bore you with the, with the actual formula, but take it, take it on good authority that the K in this case is the coherency delay. So in other words, the time for different elements of your system, different nodes in a distributed system, to synchronize on a piece of data is that coherency delay before we all arrive at the same answer. So having a higher K is worse in this formula if you actually do the math. And again, we were really talking about here parallelizable systems on a single, CP on a single node, not a single CPU, multiple CPUs on one chip. Um, Essentially, the higher the K, the higher the communication in this case, that's actually not what the K stands for, the worse our potential upside of scalability is. So, of course, you can work all of these formulas and say, okay, what is the, what would perfect scalability look like? Well, perfect scalability would look like the ability to parallelize all of our operations, 100% of our operations, then 100 minus the parallelizable portion is zero, and that's the absolute worst case that we, that we could have and the minimum k, k even zero, which means there is no coherency. Well, how do you achieve no coherency? You achieve no sharing, no sharing of data. If there's no contention, no sharing, then both of these laws start to not apply, and those relate to perfect scalability. I promise, no more formulas. <laughs> okay, so if we refer to that dog leg we saw in the curve as a wall in our scalability, it is very common to reach a point where you hit that wall, and the way you know you hit that wall is you start throwing additional nodes at your scalable system, and your performance, or your overall ability to handle load, different from your performance, goes down, not up, a little bit. Typically what that means is that you've actually hit Gunther's law in the sense that, in a distributed sense, which is really an extension of what he had in mind, but in that distributed sense where the overall necessity to synchronize between nodes in any fashion has started to exceed the ability of those new nodes to add more performance to your system. So you've actually gone backwards. The, the overhead of synchronizing those nodes is somehow greater than the difference of adding one more node. That is truly the point of diminishing returns, because at that point you can put as many more nodes as you want, you actually cannot increase your ability to handle load on that overall system. Now, the wall could be closer than that in the sense that if you're algorithming the design of your system does not follow a certain number of rules which are more about avoiding things than including things, then the wall will be where that dogleg is in the curve. Because the dogleg in the curve will be that point of increasing response time, and often it's darn near vertical. At some point, you'll get a few more requests, and suddenly your system starts to 500 and requests are starting to fail. That dogleg in the curve is what we call, is what I'm referring to as a wall whether it's caused by that coherency delay, which is probably further down, or whether it's caused much more commonly by having an algorithm that you can't fully distribute. One way or another, you run into it. The good news is that, quoting Edison here, we haven't failed to discover perfect scalability, but we know a great many more than 10,000 ways that it won't work. <laughs>
So we know a lot about, we started looking at the problem in terms of negative space. We went, okay, what are the things about a solution that would prevent it from being able to scale perfectly? And we know a lot about that. So here, I can tell you a great deal about failure. <laughs> and, and hopefully that'll inform. And what we found is that by and large, from a practical point of view, avoiding these enemies of scalability, I'll call them, is what gets you th around the wall. As opposed to simply moving the wall. It's not that hard to move the wall out a little bit. You improve your algorithm, you improve, you reduce communication time, you get faster processors. You can keep kind of shoving that dog leg in the curve further and further to the right. Can't make it go away until you fundamentally change the algorithms and the style and the architecture of your application. And even then, it's pretty tricky. So what are some of these enemies that I've talked about? Suspenseful music here. <laughs> um, contention is the obvious one. So contending over resources. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about how to avoid it. Shared state. Shared state leads to contention. Sounds like something in the Jedi Creed. <laughs> um, sharing of any data, of any state, of any information, moving messages around the network, these are all enemies of scalability, strangely. And there are ways to minimize some of these things. Ordering in sequence is one of the most insidious ones and one of the ones we see most common. Um, and it turns out that by shifting your algorithm and shifting your design, you can usually avoid ordering in sequence requirements. Um, communication, and we'll talk about that in some more detail. And then, of course, failure. Things going wrong with the overall system naturally limit the ability to scale. And we'll talk about that too. So avoiding contention. Contention, fighting over a resource, in this case a ball. Um, contention comes from parallelism or distribution. And when you think about it, distribution is just parallelism in the large. We're going across multiple machines rather than multiple cores in a single CPU. And shared state. So you can parallelize all you want, and you will never have contention. The problem comes when you start to share anything. As soon as there's some piece of state or piece of information or data that needs to be shared by more than one process in the system, you end up with contention, you end up with the scalability problem. So no shared resources avoids it. Wow, it'd be great if we could design our algorithms like that. That's the challenge. So the hard part is not necessarily to completely eliminate state, but to minimize that state which is shared. So how do we do that? The easiest way, and the way that sometimes is not obvious, and we almost have to force ourselves to do it if we've come from a little bit of the relational database world, is um, to get each dog their own stick. Basically, denormalize. You denormalize data to think about it in the database sense. What happens is you end up with duplicate information existing within your overall system. That feels unnatural at first, but in distributed systems operating at scale, it's actually completely normal and OK. And again, you have to keep repeating that to yourself sometimes when you come from the old world. But effectively, if individual processes and parts of your system have their own copy of data, well, then they're not sharing data. Now, how does that copy get updated, et cetera? These are all good questions that you have to answer eventually. So avoiding shared state is probably one of the most important. These are maybe vaguely in order of importance, in, certainly in terms of how often we see the problem, and the problem appears to be helped by doing these things. I've tried to order these enemies in that, uh, in that order. So state is great. Nothing wrong with state. We're not saying that each of your individual nodes and each of your individual processes needs to be completely stateless. Statelessness is all well and good, but an awful lot of things can't be done with statelessness. You actually do need state. That's fine. But state must be private. And private to what and private to where, we'll talk a little bit about more. So by broadcasting deltas to state, which are usually considered events, something that's happened in the past, so a command something happened in the future, an event something that's happened in the past, by broadcasting the deltas to state in some fashion, whether you're using ACA data replication or you're using uh, an event sourcing pattern, a command sourcing pattern, you can then have multiple copies of state which will eventually converge, so e.g. the basis of eventual consistency. Private state to within one element of your system, often one node of your system, maybe one microservice of your system, can then be updated from these deltas after the fact. So yes, I am talking about eventual consistency but it avoids some of those possibilities. Now, here's a counter problem. We also want to limit communication. So as part of your design patterns, when you're considering high scalability, look at all communication as a cost. In other words, I have to have a really good reason to put up with communication between my nodes. My perfect scalability would be nobody talks. <laughs> Everyone does not communicate with anyone else. They're completely independent. 
probably can't do that, but every time I add communication to my system, I am reducing my ability to scale and I'm bringing the wall a little bit closer. So point-to-point -point communications, particularly, must be seen as a form of coupling. And coupling is another one of these enemies. Take into account locality when considering that cost. So in other words, all communication is not created equal. If I communicate with another process on my local node, that's generally a lot less expensive than communicating with a process on another node, obviously. If I communicate with another node in another data center, okay, I really need to think about that one. The volume of communication that I can handle without severely compromising scalability goes down rapidly with the distance, both logically and physically, from the originator. Okay? So communication is a cost. Ordering is a huge cost because ordering actually leads to shared state in a certain sense. You must have shared state in order to preserve, or in order to pervert, preserve order, ah, or English for that matter. <laughs> um, it leads to contention and it severely limits scalability. So in the developer sense, stay commutative. It should not matter in the order in which things are applied. And we'll talk about how to do that. Some of you may already guess. Now, what's interesting is we talked about failure, and we said, of course, failure is a problem in a distributed system, in a highly scalable system. Chances are a highly scalable system is distributed. So a distributed system is actually much more likely to have something fail. It is, on the other hand, much more likely that the system will not fail. So the system as a whole and its ability to handle load at all must not fail, or obviously we have severely limited our scalability, uh, possibly to zero. If all the lights go out and the whole thing goes down, that's a problem. Now, what's interesting is the less we share, the less likely system failure is. So a whole series of completely independent, well, you know, people know this even from power supplies. If you're on the same plug and the lights go out, well, chances are they're both going to go down at the same time. If you're on completely separate independent power supplies, same thing is true of data. If your source of data is independent and not necessarily dependent on another service, which may or may not fail, and you have as few of those connections as possible and few of those dependencies as possible, then the probability of that one element failing goes, goes down. And therefore, the probability of your overall system being able to survive goes up. So again, sharing is a problem, like the dogs with the stick. It presents itself as an avoidance of linear time. So again, this is an algorithmic design pattern. This is really now down to design, not so much architecture where you use things such as finite state machines, single-use actors, um, there's many different pa saga patterns, things to avoid linear processing, where you have a whole series of steps which must be processed one after another. Well, when you think about it, that's a source of um, sequence. There is sequence in your, in your processing, even if there isn't sequence in your data. You don't have things that you say, okay, I have to process this one, two, three, but I do have to fu finish these functions one at a time. If you can avoid that, you are again avoiding the linear nature that is actually an enemy of scalability. Communications, especially between services, must be asynchronous and non-blocking. And this is also linear time. So if I have a service that calls another service, waits for the reply, and then, well, my absolute limit of scalability is whatever the scalability of that other service is, plus some constant, because I take time to process. Whereas if I could do a fire and forget message and eventually this comes back and then I send on the message, in the meantime, I've handled 20 other requests, I'm a lot more scalable than in the first scenario. So communications between services have to be async and non-blocking. That sounds easy, you know, when you say it fast. It's actually very difficult and it's one of the most common problems we see is that when you actually think about it, services are in fact temporally coupled. This has to finish before that. This has to actually send an answer back to that. You may as well combine those into a single bounded context and into a service. They'll probably be faster. So that's a case where microservices have actually been taken too far or further than is valuable from a scalability point of view in any case. It might be another good reason for separating them, but scalability isn't it. So think about design for perfect scalability as a series of principles and a series of things to avoid. And you build your services around adherence to those principles first. So for example, if I go, all right, I'm going to build this in such a fashion that I need communication between these two things. Well, ask yourself, okay, what's the cost of that communication? Is there another way? Can I have the data between those two separated? 
Can they both derive the information that they require from some separate source rather than going to each other? Because cost is a thing that, sorry, communication is a thing that costs me in my design. So you kind of do the balance sheet in your head when you're looking at a design like this. In many cases, you'll need a different algorithm. The algorithm that you originally sketched out to actually solve your problem in your domain, you'll need to go, well, hang on, that requires too much communication, or that means that these steps all have to happen sequentially. But if we did it like this, then we could avoid those enemies of scalability. You'll end up with a better design. Tuning can't fix a bad design. <laughs> and that, again, that sounds obvious when you say it fast. We have helped many a client try to you know, tune a bad design to the point where that's it. The wall is here. The wall isn't moving any further. That's the limit of the tunability. So tunability is not the answer to scalability problems. Design is. So a scalable architecture, taking it a scale up and, and going, OK, now let's think about the plumbing and the interconnection between services and so on. Obviously, avoid single points of contention, which, by the way, also avoids single points of failure, generally. <clears throat> Nothing shared. And we'll talk about what the worst possible thing to share is, and we see it all the time in a while. Uh, no state would be great. Often you have to violate some of these rules, but if you violate them as little as possible, you end up with a more scalable system. No sequence. Sequence is a killer. It actually has several of these disadvantages all built into one. And no synchronous persistence. Of course, we all know, you know talking to disk in any fashion, or uh, you know, even other persistent stores, is many times slower than not. Except, of course, when the network is actually your bottleneck, which eventually you get to. So scalability goes both ways. And this is often also forgotten. And this is actually a very common problem we see, is that clients will want a system that will scale to handle some huge load. But what they don't anticipate is how can you rapidly, successfully, without dropping requests, scale back down again when the load is starting to reduce. Oftentimes, you'll be able to predict in a particular scenario that load will be encountered on the following time frame, or you'll have a season, or you'll have, you know, everybody comes at 11.55 every morning, you have all of your requests, great. You can scale your system up. How do you go about scaling back down again? And that's often a pure cost avoidance problem, because of course if you can scale up and you can handle all the load in the world with your thousand nodes, well, a thousand nodes on Amazon is going to cost you a couple of bucks. So how do you turn that back down again? is actually a problem you have to think about. It's, it's not obvious. It's one of the reasons that one of the key attributes of microservices is mobility. I need to be able to move them around. <clears throat> so responding to load should, of course, also allow auto reduction, not just up. So what, what's it like at the high end of that scale? So we've done a few systems that are very large. The ultra large scale systems have a few characteristics. And again, these are characteristics that if you think about them now, when you're trying to scale, you don't have to try to bolt them in afterwards, because retrofitting things for scalability is often a challenging problem, shall we say, um, bordering on the impossible, let's say. So they tend to be systems of systems. So they tend to be a series of independent operating systems within an overall system that are not necessarily coupled to each other other than very, very loosely, if at all. They share some of the characteristics of organic ecosystems, interestingly enough. And you'll see what I mean by that when we talk about failure. They handle conflicting requirements. So there are actually two or three different ways of doing something within some of these ultra-large scale systems. They evolve continuously while in operation. I often use this analogy with my team. I say, um, you know, the airplane's in flight. We've got a full passenger load, and we're going to replace the wing. <laughs> you know, this is the, the, this, the, the impression you get when trying to modify an existing running system. And it's possible, but it's easier if you follow some of these things. So they're often internally inconsistent. And this is part of getting each dog their own stick a little bit. You have situations where system A and system B will, in fact, disagree about what the customer's balance is. And that might actually be OK. It's certainly a lot more scalable. And we'll talk about later balancing the need for scalability against the need for consistency and all of these things. Um, users affect overall emergent behavior. So highly scalable systems, and particularly ultra-large scale systems, are extremely difficult to predict ahead of time. So we're going to talk about monitoring. And user load and user behavior have a significant effect on where the load is coming on your system. And it's very difficult to anticipate that ahead of time. So the reaction is, let's have the ability to modify our system on the fly, such that we now need 50 more instances of that service. OK, 
if that's possible and we can scale that independently of all other pieces of our system, we can adapt to a shape to the load that we did not anticipate. And that's extremely common in ultra large scale systems. Failure is the norm. At any given moment, it is likely some piece of the system will be down. And that's okay. Just again, with an organic system, every single cell in your body is not necessarily operating at peak efficiency 24 hours a day. And that's okay. Some of them are dying. All right. The overall system, however, is not affected. You're still up. So obviously, one shape of that is spike load. Sometimes you get a whole lot more users. Sometimes they're really unhappy um, than you were expecting. Scalability means you can add resources, not that you already have. So there's nothing actually inherent about scalability that says I can handle spike load. I might be, uh, have an incredibly scalable system. I can add integers as fast as anything. But now all of a sudden there's a whole lot more people trying to add integers than I expected. I still go down. I've got an incredibly scalable system, but that doesn't mean I have scale. I need, still need the ability to add those resources when load starts to go up. Again, the importance of monitoring, which we'll talk about later. So even as basically the moral is, even a perfectly scalable system can be taken down by spike load. So some of the specific techniques we've seen to try to handle that are you put shock absorbers in your system, so to speak. Um, we frequently see Apache Kafka in this role, for instance. Command sourcing is one way to go about this. So if you differentiate a command, which is a request for something which could fail, that is supposed to happen in the future, from an event, which is the recording of something that's already happened, it's in the past, then command sourcing is essentially like event sourcing except the other way around. The original command to the system is actually what you persist. Then you handle it after you've persisted it. That way, if spike load starts to happen, you can decouple those two temporarily and say, great, we're going to record commands as fast as they come in, but we're going to process them a little later. So you're then, the shock absorber returns to normal size. So if we, just saying what's on the slide here, if we persist our commands initially and handle them asynchronously, we have a much better ability to handle spike load and to give us an opportunity to go, oh look, spike load is happening, great, let's ramp up other systems. Whether it's a human watching a graph and flipping switches uh, to bring up new nodes or an elastic load balancing system detecting that load and bringing up new nodes, it's always a lag. There's, you know, unless you're trying to predict it by saying, okay, the rate of increase is X, there's still a bit of a lag bringing up those new nodes. So although you have a system that can scale, it won't necessarily be scaled. And then the opposite is also true. Just again, like organic systems and ultra large scale systems, um, degrading gracefully is very important. Because if there are, and again, all of these attributes tie together. So the less you share, the more the probability is you will, in fact, be able to degrade gracefully. Um, I love this quote. It's actually, it was actually a comedian, not a computer scientist, that came up with it. An escalator can never break, it just becomes stairs. We have a demo of that out in the lobby, as it turns out. <laughs> See, real world, I didn't arrange that. Um, so basically, the idea is portions of the system should be able to fail without affecting other portions. That's actually a good test. Switch some services off. Do the other services still work? Great, you're not coupled. You know, if the coupling is there, if those services simply keep going with slightly out of date data, but they keep going, then you have a much more resilient system that can in fact degrade gracefully. It again is sometimes really hard to design this ahead of time. Uh, it's very hard to predict. And it is a design issue, not a tuning issue. You can't tune graceful degra degradation. The system has to be built to do that. So all of this probably points us a little bit in the direction of microservices. I'm not gonna try to duplicate other excellent talks on that. Um, but microservices do come with a cost. There's added complexity, they're more difficult to deploy, you know, this is, this is going, this is making the rounds in a lot of different circles that people are realizing, hey, this is not free. This is not a universally cheaper and easier way to build systems. But they're worth it from a scalability point of view, and that's what we're limiting ourselves to in this talk, though they have other advantages, if they provide some of the things we talk about here. That is, async communication with other services where required. And again, minimize it. The more, it's a cost keep it as low as possible. Note the word async. <laughs> I repeat myself. Isolation, which is how we get the ability to have some pieces of the system fail and the overall system keep going. And a single responsibility. Now, the single responsibility principle comes way back from the object-oriented days, applies to microservices, and it's a good design principle to just keep things clean, but there's an important element that relates specifically to scalability about that, and that is individual functions can then be tuned independently. So let's say for some reason, a whole bunch of people start logging in 
but not doing anything else in your system. Well, you probably need more instances of the login service. But if the login service is also the one that does five other things, well, then it's hard to say, I need just more login. I need more capacity around that function, around that particular piece of my system, but not other pieces necessarily. You can't change the shape of your capacity handling easily unless each element of your system does only one thing. Then you can just say, great, give me more of those. And you can increase capacity that way. So that's the attribute of microservices that specifically relates to that. Um, and most importantly, has its own data. So a microservice should, has its, ha should have its own data, which is not shared with other services. Talk about that again in another minute. Simple is good. So if your system's diagram starting to look like this, you're not going to scale. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it, you know, and, and it's, this, is, this is a joke, obviously. However, I've seen system diagrams that look worse than this. Um, they didn't have the little moving balls. They really needed to for the message passing. You know, I thought it really looked like a, a badly done ACA job. Um, however, complexity doesn't scale. So on top of all of the other things I'm telling you to avoid, I am telling you to steer towards simplicity and avoid complexity. Because actually, a lot of the principles we're talking about are initial principles, first principles, that actually encourage simplicity. <clears throat> so simple patterns applied consistently, consistently, way easier to scale than a complex pattern. Coordinating on time, which is incredibly common, really easy to fall into mentally, um, doesn't work at all in a distributed system, right? It is physically an impossibility. Uh, I think Wade's going to talk about that at one point. And so the worst kind of coordination you can have in a system is temporal. Uh, I love this quote, the man with two watches never knows what time it is. It is an approximation. Clock time specifically cannot be used for ordering. So one, ordering is bad. Clock time to do it is even worse. And we see the two of them combined often. Persistence doesn't have to be a bottleneck, but it is, again, a cost that you have to think about minimizing. Command sourcing is one way to do that. Item potency is another way to do it. The file system, strangely, is often the fastest choice. Databases seldom are. Uh, we often, however, see Cassandra, Postgres, HDFS in this space, but sometimes we see things like Kafka, which do, in fact, generally persist to the file system. Uh, streaming is your friend, talking to the file system. A way to pick the right spot to persist without persisting any more than necessary, because it is such a high cost, is to think about where you need to recover. This is our favorite metric, is to say, OK, if I had to pick that request back up and do it again, and item potency is how I can do it again, where would I need to do that? At what point in the system could I, do I need to recover? Not could I. What point in the system must I recover from? Where there's a failure, I can pick it back up. And my favorite spot for that is at the very beginning. So command sourcing. When I get the initial request, persist that. Great. Done. Now the system cannot fail because I can always pick that back up out of persistence and do it again. Now, if I can do it again, that means that I have item potency. We'll talk about that later. The most egregious pattern that we see that it leads to many of the others and brings many of them together is to not keep your hands out of other people's databases, essentially, is the way we put it, is the worst thing to share is a database. If your services share a database, this is also a great quote, then your database is your monolith. So if you've done microservices but you share a database, all you've done is move the monolith. It's now in that box over there marked database. Services have to keep their mitts out of other people's databases. They have to have their own independent source of private state. So therefore, their own independent database storage mechanism. Doesn't matter what that mechanism is, as long as you don't share it with anybody else. So CRDTs and event sourcing are ways to share that state. We talked about them before, where you broadcast a delta to the state and say, hey, anybody that cares, this just changed. If you need to update your local data store, knock yourself out. Distributed transactions are, um, you know, a sea monster is a good way of putting it. Lots of arms, they go everywhere and suck everything down with them. They are actually the exact opposite of the philosophical approach we find works the best. In other words, that's actually solving the problem, but solving it by going in exactly the wrong direction, by attempting to impose a global now, in some sense, in some portion across your system. So if you find yourself thinking, hmm, I'm going to need more transactions here, or more than one service is going to need a transaction, you probably need to back up and look at that design again for persistence. So item potency is how we can recover only at the spot we need to recover. What I mean by that is, let's say we command source. So every time we get a request into our system, the first thing we do is save it. Then all of the other processing in our system could be repeated if, of course, the system goes down halfway through processing and we pick that back up out of persistent storage, see, hey, it hasn't been checked off. We haven't done it yet. Do it again. 
if our system is okay with that, then we've achieved item potency and we can persist less. So scalability is improved by having item potency. Right? It's, a, it's a third order relationship, but basically item potency says we don't need to persist as much because we could just recover the whole thing again by replaying the command in its entirety. And my system is okay with that. So item potency is important in terms of scalability. And that's why I was saying persist only where you need to, and where you need to is where do I need to recover? I'm going to do it. Okay, a few more minutes. Um, consistency helps. So the idea of domain-driven design and consistency, again, I encourage you to go to Wade's talk where he's going to explain what's in this picture. However, focus, focusing on the domain and not the plumbing is really the core of DDD and Onion. And a consistent approach helps ensure that you're actually following these principles. So if you have a way of splitting up your system that is always maintained consistently in your code base, you're ahead of the game as opposed to every service being different, then you're going to have to look for those enemies of scalability in a different place every time. Otherwise, you can get some good patterns going at certain layers of the architecture and be consistent about it. By encapsulating bounded context in a single service or a tightly knit group of services, communication is therefore limited. So in other words, everything to do with customers is in this service. Great. Therefore, customer information doesn't need to be communicated to anybody else. I own the customer state. I keep it private. I keep it internal. That's a DDD concept applied to scalability. Now, obviously, scalability is not always the only concern. We have, you know, we need to go fast. We need velocity. We have lots of features. So scalability and simplicity must be balanced against cost in every case. How much do I need to scale? How far do I need to push the wall is a good consideration but always give yourself some buffer space. And if you follow some of these design principles, even though you don't necessarily need them in your scalability level now, then you avoid the syndrome of, that we've seen in some clients where success is their worst enemy. You know, our, our site is taking off. Oh no, our site is taking off. <laughs> you know, we're, we're starting to get all sorts of traffic. That's great, marketing think it's wonderful. And the tech guys are ready to pull their hair out because they're not ready for that scalability. Trying to, re trying to retool your system to handle scalability at the moment of success is far too late. So now, quickly to talk about monitoring. Uh, trust your design, but at the same time verify. By definition, a distributed system is non-deterministic. Therefore, I don't actually know what it's going to do under load. The more complex that system gets and the more pieces of it there are, the less I know what it's going to do under load. So how do I, how do I predict? I don't. I follow. I find out what it's going to do under load by monitoring. What you monitor, how much you monitor, um, load tests are a necessity. Monitoring can tell you things that design and tests, static tests in an isolated environment, can't tell you. The log is not enough, to paraphrase 007. Um, log aggregation is necessary. That's great. You can see what's going on in logging. Logging, of course, is yet another cost, and you have to watch for contention. Um, VM and node monitoring is great. Uh, throughput and response time monitoring is also handy. If you're using an active system, monitoring time in mailbox and mailbox size is probably one of the stats you're most interested in because that's showing you the shock absorbers in the small in your system. But be careful how you monitor. It's also possible to build monitoring into your system and slow it down. So we've seen uh, techniques such as push monitoring where you're actually sending statistics to a centralized server over UDP or something, stats D, and so on. Uh, we've also seen pull monitoring where you connect to each node and pull statistics that are aggregated internal to the node via JMX. Both of those have downsides and you have to carefully balance those downsides, keep thinking about communication as a cost. And that's communication. DevOps matters a lot in highly scalable systems. In a perfectly scalable system, you have to be able to do a rolling upgrade, for example. You have to be able to have your system, again, in consistency. You have to have some nodes of your system are on version 1, other nodes of your system are on version 1.5, and everything's still OK. Because if you can't upgrade your system, then by definition, you can't scale it, because you actually have to turn it off in order to, or turn some pieces of it off, in order to roll out a new version. So you have to think about versioning of messages, you have to think about a rolling restart, and so on. All of that is greatly facilitated by modern DevOps tools. So things such as Mesos, and Decos, and Conductor, and so on, um, help a lot. That's all I have time to say on that, is that that's essential. You can't overlook it. It is the most commonly overlooked section when we talk about scalable systems. Everybody's all excited about the design, Ah, oh, this is going to be amazing. It's going to scale like crazy. How do we deploy it? And everybody stops and looks at each other. Um, well, <laughs> so ask that question good and early and deploy as a process of day one. Okay, nearly at the end. So perfect scalability is, in fact, achievable. It 
not with every design. There are some designs that will not scale, no matter what you apply to them in terms of resources. If you avoid those enemies of scalability we were talking about, you're better off than if you don't. Those are the rules of thumb that I can give you that we've found over the years that make a big difference, and almost in order of importance. Keeping out of other people's databases maybe being number one. Um, find the patterns of the design, of design, that don't use those enemies. So for example, CQRS, event sourcing, these are some of the things that allow you to avoid some of those enemies. That's why they work, is because they're staying away from these things. So you almost set up to design your system in a negative sense, by going, what should I not do? OK, great. Anything that's not in that bucket, chances are that's all right. Monitor and adjust. Monitoring is critical. And embrace and handle failure. It's going to fail. That's OK. As long as it doesn't take the whole system down, you're still all right. OK, time for a couple of questions. Anyone have that expression? I don't actually see any tilted heads. But it sums it up. No? Stunned silence? Oh, wait. <laughs> Very funny. I'm writing a book with Wade. Not about this, interestingly enough. No, and you can't make me. That's <laughs> the answer to that question. Anybody else? Please. Do you persist in requests before handling them and after the system fails? Mm -hmm. What do you reply to the person? That's an excellent question. Um, there's a lot of detail behind it. So the question was if we persist a request, um, then what do I reply? One thing I could reply is, OK, got the request. And then have the client or reply with, let's say, a UUID that I've generated in a distributed fashion, no sequential numbers, a UUID I've generated to say, ask me in a little while for the answer. If the client is smart enough to say, OK, now I need the reply, great, come back. So avoiding that synchronous loop of communication is quite possible, even with HTTP. And of course, there's always web sockets, too, where you can keep a socket open, but that has its own problems. One of the favorite answers I've seen is, uh, I think it's a 204, which has no content. So I don't have an answer for you. I got it. I heard you. Thank you. And then later you can say, OK, now, what's, what's the answer? You know, that's a separate request from the client. That's one favorite pattern. There's many others. Clients that do routing. Uh, right. And Sharding now is kind of moving into application levels, and especially in Okta, mm -hmm. sharding, which is we're just introducing it now into our system. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that as far as scalability? Sharding is a cost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't do it unless you have to. Right. Make somebody back you into a corner before you pick that choice. There is, for example, it's one of the reasons that cluster sharding requires active persistence, is that there needs to be state stored in order to do it. So you're actually adding a significant amount of cost. And the reason you're doing it, the compromise you're making, is for consistency. So if I could avoid consistency, which sounds very strange, please do so. You're way better in terms of scalability. So, that, so that's more of an eventual price. consistent system. What's that? Eventual consistency. Exactly, system. yeah. The more, the larger eventually can be, the more scalable you can be, to be honest. You know, the larger the answer of what's eventually mean, you know, is it milliseconds? Mm, need to be pretty consistent pretty close to consistent. If it's minutes, OK, I can scale pretty far then. So that's the price you're paying, basically. So I, I always say active clustering is a great answer to a problem I hope you don't have. Not active cluster, active cluster sharding. Yeah, active cluster actually is also a communication overhead, which you have to be careful about. Right? The gossip protocol isn't free either. And eventually, it will scale out. What else do you have? Thank you. Earlier, you mentioned that we should avoid uh, sharing the database. Yes. Uh, can you share some techniques uh, how, how we are able to achieve that? Yes, absolutely. It's actually the worst thing you can do for your scalability. Because like I said, if your microservices share your database, then your database, is, your database is your monolith. And the way to avoid that is essentially denormalize. Every service can have its own persistent store. If it needs one, is the first question. Can I avoid one altogether? Great, I win. If I don't need to store anything, that's a great service. Often I need to store something. Store it independently, store it locally, and store it isolated. Don't share it with anybody else, and update my local state based on, let's say, event sourcing. That's one way to go. Have an event bus that says, OK, the customer just bought something. Therefore, you know, customer inventory just gets adjusted based on an event that trickles through the system. Those two systems don't even know each other exist. I just I emit an event with the I'm just saying pattern. <laughs> 
and then somebody picks it up and says, ah, I need to decrement the amount of X available. If those two could be completely independent, you're better off. You can't always do it. You know, it's, it's again one of these trade-offs, but if you can, that's the most common technique to do it, is CQRS and event sourcing. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? I can't actually see you back there, so if somebody's raising their hand in the back, I won't be able to tell. Okay, I think we're out of time in any case, so thank you very much, everybody, for coming.